Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to talk about the Gaussian mixture models. Why do we need them? Journey we've had so far was something like this. We've seen clusters which are nicely separated and every single point is assigned one unique cluster label, which is known as the hard clustering, which means every single point is so nicely separated from the other points that it can be only given one membership. And it is actually doable for this kind of data that you see on the screen. But what if our data was something like this? It's all mixed up. So if you look at it carefully, there is a potential of looking at a cluster like this, which is more of a cluster for these orange points, and another cluster like this, which is more of a cluster for these blue points. But why a conventional technique like k-means would not work here is because the center of these two clusters is overlapping. And we know that k-means is a centroid-based technique. So it decides the cluster membership based on the proximity to the centers. What if the centers are overlapping like these? In such cases, the Gaussian mixture models come to our rescue. Let's say we have some data points in a one-dimensional space. So these are different data points that we have. And these are all real numbers, which means they are numerical values. These are not classes like zero and one. These are all real numbers. So whenever some real numbers appear before us, the first thing that comes to mind is a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution. So the Gaussian mixture model assumes that these data points have been generated using some kind of Gaussian distribution. And to begin with, we also need to decide how many Gaussian distributions we are talking about. So in a way, this is similar to deciding the number of K clusters in case of K-means. Here, we're deciding the number of Gaussian distributions. Let's say we start by assuming that there are two Gaussian distributions. So as a part of step one, we randomly initialize the Gaussians. Note that two is just a number that we chose in this example. It is not mandatory that we'll always have just two Gaussians. We could have more as well. And we are working on a particularly simple example, which is only one dimensional data, whereas our data could be multi-dimensional. Once we have randomly initialized these two Gaussian distributions, in the next step, we have to calculate something that's known as the responsibility. In very simple terms, I can say it's the probability of belongingness for each point. So for each data point, we need to assign to what extent does it look like a point belonging to this blue distribution or this orange distribution. So for example, a data point here, while it is in a less dense blue region, it still is away from the orange distribution. So it is more likely to be blue compared to orange. This is just an appearance. It will always have a small share of orange, which is not even visible here. Similarly, a data point here, which is in a relatively less dense orange region, is even farther from the blue distribution. So it's more likely to be orange. And what about the data points in between? They are more likely to be a mix because in this region, there is a little bit of uncertainty. Same would be the case with these points. So all these points in the middle would be claimed by both the distributions. The proportions might vary. For example, here, it may be an equal claim from both the distributions. Whereas the points which are very close to the center, which is the high density region for any distribution, might be more prone to get that color. This color coding is something that you can call as a responsibility. So we are saying that this point is more likely to be a point belonging to the blue distribution. So the probability of this point being a point from the blue distribution is higher compared to the probability that this point belongs to the orange distribution. Notice that the responsibility or just another name for probability as we are calling it would always add up to one. So if you have three Gaussians, maybe all three would claim for each point but all the probabilities of belonging to these distributions will always add up to one because there are only three possibilities. In our case, we are looking at only two possibilities and that's why we are saying these will add up to one. Once we are done with assigning the responsibility to each data point, the next step is to only focus on specific points for particular Gaussians, which means right now we are only going to consider the blue points first and then we will consider the other points, which means we'll have to consider these points for each Gaussian distribution separately. So we already have done the responsibility assignment. Now, as per the presence of these blue points, we are going to reconsider the distribution assignment, which means we are going to once again compute the normal distribution. A normal distribution, as you know, is characterized by its mean and standard deviation. Mean is where the center lies, 
and a standard deviation determines the shape of the normal distribution. So let's say we come up with this Gaussian as a revised distribution. And similarly, for the orange data points, we once again calculate the normal distribution. Remember, originally we just did a random initialization of these Gaussians. Now we are calculating based on the responsibility. So let's say we find this Gaussian distribution now. So we have these as our distributions till now. Now we are supposed to repeat certain steps. So with respect to these distributions, now let's look at the data points all over again. And once again, we need to determine the responsibility. Notice that responsibility is influenced by the Gaussians and Gaussian parameters are determined by the responsibilities. So it's kind of a cyclic process. We started with the random Gaussian distributions, computed the responsibilities. Then based on those responsibilities, we revisited the normal distribution parameters like mean and variance. And we are saying we'll once again compute the responsibility. So as for this blue Gaussian distribution, maybe a lot of these points are now closer to the center. So we will say that these points will mostly be blue. So why do you see this as entirely blue? Please note that normal distribution is asymptotic, which means this distribution is not limited till this point, or this blue distribution is not just limited till this point. They extend till infinity. So this would always have some influence of the orange distribution here as well, but that maybe is minuscule. Similarly, these points here, while they're closer to the high density region of a normal distribution, which is orange, they will also have some influence of the blue distribution, but maybe that's minuscule right now. Whereas the points in between would always tend to have more of a mix. So the first difference here compared to the classic clustering algorithms is that these points are soft clustered. We are not saying that these have to strictly belong to one cluster or the other. We are accepting that there may be a mix but there may be a majority influence of one particular distribution and we will go by that. And these steps of calculating the responsibility and revisiting the model parameters will be repeated. For example, you may end up getting this as the final out. At what stage do we stop? When do we say that we have converged or we have reached the end conclusion? When we do not see much change in the parameters for these Gaussian distributions. When we continue to repeat these steps, but beyond a point, the distributions don't really change significantly. We say that we have converged and that's how we will determine the clusters. So once again, to summarize, what is the similarity between Gaussian mixture models and k-means clustering? Just like k-means clustering, this is also an iterative approach. In k-means, we used to iteratively determine the centroids till we finally converged. Here, we iteratively determine the mean and the variance. And this is applicable only when we are dealing with one-dimensional data. The moment we go to multi-dimensional space, we will no longer have just one mean value. We'll have a mean vector. Likewise, we'll not just have one variance. We will have a variance-covariance matrix, which means there will be much more complicated calculations there. But the basic idea stays the same. That's why we try to understand it with the help of one-dimensional exam. Now, what is it that's different in case of Gaussian mixture models? Unlike k-means, Gaussian mixture models follow soft clustering technique, which means we do not assume a point's strict membership to a cluster. We say that there is a possibility that a given point could belong to multiple clusters, and we may look at the proportion. While we didn't go too deep into the technicality, the steps that we have followed here confirm that this is a probabilistic model. Why? Because we are assuming that there is a distribution. Whereas in case of k-means, we never assume that the data follows a specific distribution. And the steps two and three that you've seen here, wherein we first calculate the responsibility based on the random initialization. And then in the next step, we calculate the distribution parameters based on the responsibility and alternatively continue to repeat these steps. This is a part of expectation maximization algorithm. Step two is known as the E step or the expectation step. Step three is known as the maximization step. Please note the equations related to Gaussian mixture models could be quite daunting because these involve heavy formulae. But for our purpose, we've tried to explain this in the simplest possible way without using too many jargons. So I hope you get clarity on how Gaussian mixture models are useful, in what cases they are more meaningful compared to the k-means. Thank you.